Great, so it's the top of the hour, so we will be starting. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, my name is Renata Centillion, and I'm the Senior Operations and Strategy Manager here at Ghost Inspector. Um, this is our second webinar. We're so excited to see that our um, users and potential users are responding so well to uh, these webinars. Um, if you um, didn't know about our first webinar, shameless plug, it is on our blog. It was on our recently released accessibility feature. So uh, feel free to check that out. Um, for anyone, I know we're going to get asked this multiple times, so don't worry, I will repeat myself for anyone else. This session is being recorded and it will be sent out to anyone who registered, and it also will be posted on our blog in a few days, on um, the same blog post um, um, where this uh, event was mentioned. So. Thanks again. So at Ghost Inspector, you know, we pride ourselves in making our tools super easy to use for anyone. Uh, no code needed um, when it comes to testing, but we still get some of our even most um, advanced power users coming in and asking if they're getting the most out of Ghost Inspector. Is there more? Is there more they could be using Ghost Inspector for? So uh, we decided this would be a great way to sort of present some of those um, nuanced and advanced features and maybe different ways to use Ghost Inspector that maybe some of our users uh, didn't know about. Um, so for today's agenda, Justin will be going over some of those features. Um, so someone's, I'm sorry, someone in chat saying they can't hear me, but uh, I am uh, coming through. So please try logging out and logging back in. Um, again, so for the agenda today, Justin will be going over that. Um, he'll be sharing his screen and doing a live demonstration. And then we're also super happy to be joined today by Autumn Bruno from our preferred partner, JDA QA. Um, they offer professional services to a lot of Ghost Inspector clients um, who would like some help getting set up uh, and getting um, their test uh, working with uh, JDA QA. So she'll be handling um, some of what they offer and some awesome, uh, interesting ways that they're helping clients um, like many of yourselves. Um, so with that being said, I'll kick it over to Justin to um, start the presentation. And once again, this is being recorded and it will be sent out to everyone uh, in a day or two. So thanks again for joining everyone. Feel free to send questions directly to me. And after the presentation, uh, we'll um, start uh, asking our panelists a few of the questions everyone's got. Great, yeah, thanks Renata. Hey everybody, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and just uh, confirm that it's coming through. So let's see. Renata, can you give me a verbal confirmation that's coming through? Yep. Awesome. Okay, hey everybody, my name is Justin Clem. I'm the founder and CEO at Ghost Inspector. Uh, and today uh, I'm gonna be talking to you about getting the most um, out of Ghost Inspector. I just want to extend uh, a really warm welcome to everybody for joining and a, and a big thank you to our customers for using our tool um, and for being here today. Uh, so I have an agenda for the presentation, but before I jump into it, I just want to give a couple of notes um, about some of the things I'm going to cover. Um, so the first point is I'm, I'm going to move pretty quickly and I'm going to try to cover lots of material because I think everybody's kind of hungry to, to, to see what we've got. Um, so this may not be the ideal uh, the ideal uh, webinar to follow along with. Um, you might wanna watch it and you can always come back as Renata mentioned, it'll be posted online and you can reference some of the things I'm doing uh, and work on applying them to your own account if you'd like. Uh, secondly, I'm gonna be focusing on a lot of core features and settings and things that I think are gonna give you the most bang for your buck and help you cover some of the use cases um, and different situations you may be facing. We have lots of really nice shiny features that are awesome, like visual testing and email testing and accessibility testing. Um, and I'd love to cover those, but I, I can't fit them all. So I'm trying to kind of um, start with the fundamentals uh, that are gonna help you uh, get your test in a really good spot. And then maybe we'll circle around and talk about extending it to use all of Ghost Inspector's features. Um, lastly, I'm gonna show lots of different approaches and options for testing. Um, and I will be touching on some things that we consider like best practices, uh, but 
keep in mind that there are often lots of ways to accomplish the same thing in Ghost and Spectre, and there's not necessarily a, a right approach for some of these things. You know, so um, use the setup that makes sense for you. If you've got a great setup in place and I'm suggesting something different, don't feel like you've got to change to adjust to what I'm showing you. I'm just going to be trying to show, show you lots of different approaches and options you can use in your tests and your settings um, to help you handle any situation you might be facing. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of the agenda. Um, lots of stuff. So as I'm moving kind of from point to point, this, this whole webinar on, on my side is going to be almost entirely like demo working in the app. Um, but I'll jump back to this slide just to kind of make a clean break between topics. Um, but we're going to talk about importing tests. So recording tests that you're going to reuse, like sets of steps, uh, importing those into other tests and some best practices and a few features that you may not know about when it comes to doing that. Uh, we're going to talk about running tests with multiple browser screen size and geolocations. We've got a pretty slick update that went live a month or two ago that is maybe a little bit under the radar, but gives you some really nice options for running a test with a whole slew of different browsers and screen size and options and reusing that same test. We're going to talk about variables. So that's um, basically putting variables in your test so you can swap values in. And I'll show you how you can use variables in steps, in settings, even in JavaScript to really customize your tests. Um, and then we're gonna build on top of that with data-driven testing and environments. And we'll actually use those variables um, as a means of running our test with lots of different data, but also running our tests across different environments, which I think is one of the biggest challenges folks face when testing is how do I reuse the same set of tests and run them on a staging server and then production and then a different branch. So I'm gonna give you what, what we think is a pretty pretty neat way for handling that. We'll talk about sequential testing. Um, as you probably know, Ghost Inspector runs tests uh, in parallel by default and that's really what we recommend because that's very fast. So you have 20 tests, you run 20 tests at the same time, you're gonna get through them pretty quickly. But you may have some situations where you need to run tests in order. So maybe you create an account, then you log in with that account, then you place an order with that account. And these things are all happening sequentially. Um, we do have some nice options uh, for doing that. So I'm gonna show some best practices there. We'll talk about local tunneling. So that's actually, if I have a copy of my website running locally on my laptop, how can I test that with Ghost Inspector? And then lastly, I'm going to introduce you to our CLI, our command line tool that makes it really easy to trigger tests, customize lots of options, um, even do tunneling really simply from the command line. Um, so lots of stuff, like I said, we're going to move pretty quickly, but I'll come back to this slide each time I'm moving from one topic to the next. Um, okay, so let's get started. Uh, I'm going to pop over here to my Ghost Inspector account, and my assumption here is that most folks in this call have a little bit of knowledge about Ghost Inspector. Um, so I'm not going to explain like all the all the basics. We're just going to jump into to building some tests. I've got this webinar uh, suite set up, and this is the one we're going to use today. So we're going to um, have a couple of different tests running in the suite, um, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and use the recorder to set up some initial tests here. I'm going to pop over to our demo site. This is a site we used to demo on, and it's set up kind of like a, a store. Um, so the idea is throughout this demo, we can imagine that I'm like a QA or a test engineer or a tester, uh, and this is my company's website, and I'm going to be building tests on it. Uh, so the first test I want to set up that we're going to use is a simple login test. And ultimately, we're going to use this as a part of our other test to log in in the beginning. So I'm just going to come up to the extension. Um, I'm going to start recording a test. I'm already logged in and connected to my account. Start recording. I'm going to come up and click login. Get a form here. We're going to give it some credentials. Say test, test .com. Give it a password. We'll log in. Um, and then the last thing I want to do, like huge best practice, if there's anything you take away from this call, uh, it should be this. Um, I always end my test with an assertion. And I recommend recording assertions throughout whenever you do something kind of interactive, like submit a form. Um, but when I when I choose this make assertion mode, I get a crosshair and I can select things on the page. In this case, the login form dumps us back on the home page. So I'm going to just assert this text and that's going to make sure that the login worked and I landed back on the home page here. I'll go ahead and finish my test. We'll call this login. We're going to put it in our webinar suite. Um, we do a screenshot comparison. I'm actually not gonna to touch on that too much today. Uh, we'll go ahead and do an initial test run. 
And we're gonna use the suite URL. I've already got this base URL set up in the suite. So we'll just default to that. We'll save the test. Um, and right away, I'm gonna hop in and record another test again. So say record new test, start recording again. Um, this time I'm gonna come down and add an item to the shopping cart. So I'll click on this cut planter, add it to cart. You can see I performed an action here, right? I got a response. So um, for me, like perfect opportunity to capture an assertion, make sure I got this message that I expected. Come back here to record operations. I'll close our window, come to our shopping cart. And then again, I'm gonna perform an assertion to make sure I got this, this item in the cart. Uh, and we'll stop there. So we'll finish this test. We'll call this one add item to cart, put it in the webinar. We'll go ahead, all the same settings. We'll do initial test run. Um, and so we've got our, our two tests. I'm gonna pop back to the suite now and refresh. You can see I've got my two tests. The, the login test has finished. Uh, my add item to cart test is still running. Come in here to our login test, just make sure this looks okay. We can see it's assigning the email, submitting, performing the assertion. Um, just double check the video real quick. Um, a really quick point here, something I use all the time when I'm troubleshooting, just to be aware of, our videos highlight the, the element being interacted with, and we do show the step number up here. So what I like to do is actually pause the video um, because I'm impatient and I'll just like, I'll just drag through and say, I want to look at step number six, I'll just drag step number six. Or if I want to look at two, I drag back to two. Um, so just kind of a handy tip there. You don't have to sit here and watch your whole video. You can pause it and jump around pretty quickly. Um, so we'll pop back to our webinar. Okay, our, our webinar suite, our add item to cart test is done. We'll come and take a look at this and see that everything looks good being added to the cart. Um, now, my intent with this test is to actually log in in the beginning, um, and I captured my login steps separately so that I can use them in various different different tests. Um, so in order to use them in this test, I'm going to come into setting uh, a, a step, excuse me, and up at the top here, I'm just going to add above to add a step. I'm going to come in and select import steps from test. Uh, and I get a big drop down of, of all the tests in my account actually. So I can, I can choose anything I'd like here, but I'm gonna choose my webinar login steps. Um, and so when I run my test now, it's gonna drop in those login steps and then it's gonna continue on with the steps in this test. So I'll save that. Um, let's just go ahead and let that run. Um, now, so I, that's something that most, most people are, are pretty familiar with this concept. Something I wanna show you though, if we pop back to webinar, um, since I'm only going to be using this login test as basically like a reusable snippet, I don't really intend to run it directly. We have a nice setting that you may not be aware of. If you pop into settings here, I can come down to modularization. And I've got a checkbox here that allows me to mark this test as an import only. So it's basically a way to tell Ghost Inspector, this test isn't meant to be run directly. It should only be used as an import. Uh, and when I check this box, it simplifies things a lot for me. It removes all these settings, which aren't really applicable anymore because I'm not gonna be running this test directly. I can even fetch a list and see where this test is being imported. Um, and when I save it in this import only mode, it actually changes the way the test screen looks as well. It's not gonna show me results anymore because it knows I'm not running it directly. It's actually just gonna go ahead and show me where this test is used. Uh, so this can be really handy if, if, if you're using a test uh, as an import in lots of places, you'll see exactly where it's used and that, that can be useful to you. If I pop back out to the webinar suite, um, you can see now it's changed the listing as well. I don't have this option to run it directly. Um, and for status, it's labeled it as import only. Uh, and if I actually run the suite now, it's only gonna run the add item to cart test. So it effectively disables this test from running directly. Um, this can also be a handy option to use if you actually just wanna temporarily disable a test. If you're like working on a test or it's part of a suite and you don't want it to run right now, um, you can go, go ahead and, and jump into this, this setting and flip it on. And then when you're ready, you can flip it back off. Um, in the past, and this is still a recommendation that we've mentioned a lot, like you can take these modules and you can move them to a separate suite. So for instance, you know, we recommend maybe a partial suite or an includes, if you want to kind of group them all together, um, that's totally fine too. And I can do both of these things. I can mark it as import only and then move it out of the suite. 
But this gives you an option if you want to keep it in the same suite, because maybe it's only used in this suite, you can have it here and you don't have to worry about it being accidentally triggered directly. If I come into my add item to cart test here, we can see now the login steps are being imported in the beginning. So I'm logging in and we get this little label for these imported steps uh, and then it moves on. Um, <clears throat> another tip in case you haven't noticed it is we've got this collapse imported steps link up here. And if I click that, it's actually gonna collapse down my imported steps. Um, so I probably don't need to look at my login steps every time I come in and jump, at a test, uh, jump into a test. So I can just toggle this setting if I wanna uh, condense them down. And that makes it a little bit easier for me to come in here, uh, take a look at my test and, and troubleshoot what's happening. Uh, so importing tests, really great, really great uh, practice, especially if you've got portions of your of your tests that are going to be reused. The next thing I want to talk about is running tests with multiple browsers, screen sizes, and geolocations. Um, so what's really nice, which we changed recently, um, which you know isn't super obvious, but I'll point out now. If I come into settings, you know you can see right now we're running this test in Chrome ninety one with a certain screen size and a certain geolocation. Um, I can change all these things in my settings, but um, what we kind of what we kind of snuck out is that these select boxes are now actually multiple select boxes. So I can come in and say, run this test in the latest version of Chrome and the latest version of Firefox. I can come down to display options. I can say, you know, run this in uh, 1280 and run it in uh, 1440 and 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 mobile sizes as well. I can come into geolocations and I can say run this in Northern Virginia and also run it in London, England. Um, and so uh, when this test runs, it's going to run a combination of all these settings. So I've got two geolocations, two screen sizes, uh, two browser settings. So when I save this test and I run it, you can see Ghost Inspector is actually going to trigger eight instances of this test now. Um, because I've got two browsers times two screen sizes times two geolocations. So each of these rows uh, represents a, a unique combination um, of, of my settings. Uh, so this makes it really nice if you want to have the same test and just set it to run with all different types of settings. Um, in the past, we were limited in our settings and we made you basically choose one. So one browser, one screen size, one geolocation. And a recommendation was to like duplicate you know, your suite or your test. So you might have like a Firefox version of your suite or a Chrome version of your suite. Um, but what this setting lets you do is um, just really quickly make all those settings apply to a single test uh, and run through all of them uh, with a click of a button. Um, the one thing to keep in mind here is that obviously each of these test runs is going to count as a test run. So when I trigger this test now, I'm, I'm running eight instances of my test. I'm no longer running one. So that has some implications on how many test runs you're using. But if you're looking for this really wide coverage of different browsers, different screen sizes, different geolocations, uh, these settings make it really easy. I'm just going to go ahead and um, flip these back off so that we're not running uh, eight copies of this test um, throughout the demo. And of course, um, I can come out to my suite as well, and I can apply these settings as well. So at the suite level, I can also come into test defaults, uh, and I can also make multiple selections for browser version, uh, for screen size, uh, and for geolocation. So that's a re really handy feature for getting just a really wide amount of coverage in terms of screen sizes, browsers, locations. The next thing we're gonna talk about is variables. Um, so variables are a way to um, take like hard-coded values out of your tests, out of your settings, out of your start URLs, out of your steps, uh, and replace them with uh, variables that can be easily swapped in. Um, so let's see. Um, I want to um, use a couple of variables here. So we'll jump into our login test. And let's say I'm going to use a variable here for my email address. Um, this is going to let me customize this email address when I run the tester suite. This is kind of like the most basic place I might use a variable, but I can also use variables here. I could actually say, you know, this is an email selector and I can have that selector stored somewhere or customize it. 
another kind of thing to point out here in case you're not aware of it, we do support multiple selectors. So um, you can add a whole bunch of different selectors um, for each step if you'd like. A little, little bit of a tangent there. Um, so I've got my email variable in here. I can even do things like um, add a JavaScript um, conditional here. And I can say, uh, uh, the way a conditional works is to execute the step if I return a true value and skip it if I return false. So I could even come in here, drop in an environment variable and say, um, you know, when I pass in this production variable, you should run the step. And if I don't, you should skip it. Uh, so variables can really be dropped in and, and used in a, in a ton of different places, but we're going to just use it in a couple sim simple places today. Uh, the first is in this email step. So I'll save that. Um, the next is uh, in my start URL. So um, I'm actually going to do this at the suite level. Uh, I've got um, my start URL set here to, you know, the website I recorded on, right? But um, let's assume for a minute that I want to customize that. So we'll call this website URL. Uh, so I've got two variables. I've got an email variable for the for the login. I've got this website variable. And what I can do is come in and set default values for those. So we've got website URL. We'll, we'll drop that value back in. We've also got an email. We'll drop the value we had back in. Uh, and um, we've got our two val uh, variables specified. So if I come in here and um, you know, I, I run this test. It, it's going to look the same, right? Because I've I've got the same email uh, uh, start URL specified. I've got the same email on the login. Um, but what this does is open up the door for me to pass in different values for these variables, um, and I can do that through the API. Um, I can do that um, through uh, custom run settings. Um, I can also do it through data sources. So. Um, kind of the most basic way I would do this is under this more menu, I would say run test with custom settings. And what I do is I come down here and say, uh, website URL should actually equal, you know, something else, right? Um, so it started on a different URL, I could give it a different email value and, and pass that in here as well, right? Um, so I can, I can customize this like manually by entering these, but that's really kind of the most tedious way to do it. A slightly quicker way, again, another kind of tip here in case you haven't caught it, we have these run again buttons. Um, so you'll, you'll find them down here next to each result um, and up here next to the latest result. Uh, so I can do run again. And what that's gonna do is pre-populate um, those, those variables in here. So let's clear this out. Um, I can say, I want to run this on staging. So our, our staging site is ghostinspectortest.com. And I can say XXX, I can run this test. Um, so this time it's going to run the same test, but it's going to plug in those custom, those custom variables um, that I assigned. Um, I can also pass these in through the API and specify them as well. Um, what I want to show next is, is to kind of build on this um, and talk about data-driven testing and environments. Um, so uh, what I can do now is provide spreadsheets and ultimately a, a spreadsheet stored with Ghost Inspector um, that's uh, going to have values stored for these variables. Um, really quickly, I just want to, I saw somebody raise their hand. If you have a question, I can answer that at the end. I just want to make sure I'm still... Uh, I'm still coming through. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So um, this test finish, you can see here, we've got the ghost inspector test uh, start URL and um, our XXX email that we plugged in and customized, right? So kind of the next step would be to um, provide, provide sets of values. So um, the most basic form of that is this second option here under run test with spreadsheet data. Um, so what this is going to let me do is provide a spreadsheet um, with, with data for those variables. So I've, I've got one ready here. Let's go ahead and select this data spreadsheet. I'll open this up. And you can see here, I've created a simple spreadsheet where I've got different rows of data and different email addresses. And what I can do is customize these. And when I run the test, it's going to trigger a test run for each of these rows. 
So um, these aren't that different, right? I've, I've got the same URL, I've just got different email address. Um, but if I have 10 rows, it's gonna trigger 10 instances with each set of data. And we'll go ahead and run this so we can see it. Um, so this is one way to use data sources. Um, and it can be handy if you've got, let's say a sign up form or a contact form and you wanna hit it with all kinds of different data. You, know, you wanna hit it with those invalid email addresses and make sure it's doing the right thing. Um, you know, with empty fields and make sure it's doing the right thing. Um, so you can take any of those things that you're assigning or using in your test, turn them into variable, and then upload a spreadsheet uh, with all different um, combinations of variables. And Ghost and Spectral will, will trigger a test run for, for each one. Um, the next way I can use this, which I think is a, a really handy way, is uh, to support environments. Um, you can see here, here's one of the, one of the test runs with account two. Um, so if I come into settings here, you know, a second ago we uploaded a spreadsheet, right? But um, it might be a little manual to have to upload that every time. So what I can do is use this data sources option to actually store that spreadsheet with Ghost Inspector. Um, so I don't have any data sources yet. I'm going to come in here to manage data sources. Um, they're stored at my organization level. So I can also get to this by going to uh, my name and settings and coming in to um, data sources. So what I can do here is actually upload uh, this spreadsheet uh, and have it stored on Ghost Inspector's, um, on Ghost Inspector's uh, uh, application. So here's the data one I use. Let's go ahead and we'll save that one. Um, what I've also got here is I've got one called staging. I'm gonna open that. And what I'm doing here is I'm just specifying one row and I've specified our staging URL and a staging email. We can even customize the name here. Let's call this staging, save that data source. And I've got one called prod. So we'll go ahead and call this production. And here I've got my production URL and my production email. I'll save that data source. I can always view these and I can, I can update them and replace them. I can change the names, et cetera. Um, now, if I come back into um, my test, and, and again, the same applies. I have these options at the suite level as well. Um, if I come back into my test and I say run with custom settings, um, now I can just pick I can essentially pick the CSV file from my data sources. Um, and what's really nice is that you, you can see how I can use this as a way to handle my different environments. So if I wanna run it on staging, I select staging and I run the test um, and it's gonna use my staging variables. Um, and if I come in here and I run it and I select um, production, it's gonna use my production variables. So what you can start to do is design your tests in a way where anything that's gonna change between your different environments can be a variable. Uh, and then you can upload like a single row spreadsheet with the variables for your different environments. I can also set defaults as well. So if I come into my test settings and my data sources, I can now say, I want the default data source um, to be staging. Um, and so if, my, if I run my test, it's going gonna, it's gonna to use staging, um, but then I can override it and say actually run this on production. So what we're doing is really kind of packaging up this, this manual process of adding these variables and specifying them and just letting me store them um, in data sources uh, and, and making that process a lot easier. So um, again, I can choose this when I run the test or the suite inside Ghost Inspector. And if I'm running this like with the API, I can just specify what data source to use. So we think it really streamlines that process of specifying your variables by storing them with Ghost Inspector and just, just choosing the environment or the data source. Um, the next topic I wanna to move on to is sequential testing. Um, so uh, sequential testing would be a situation like I mentioned at the beginning of of the call where uh, you need to carry out things in a certain order. Um, now, Ghost Inspector by default will run your tests all at the same time. So if I need to create an account and then use that account in another test, um, I'm not gonna be able to support that when I'm running my tests in parallel. Uh, sometimes what I often see from customers, the way they um, solve this problem is by creating what I, what I call the mega test. 
uh, which is that they they have basically they do all the things, um, but then they import it into one giant mega test that takes like eight minutes to run and it's like 300 steps long and it's like creating the account and logging in and placing the order and you know processing the order and doing all those things. Um, and that makes for a really uh, like a really challenging experience in terms of like troubleshooting your test and understanding what's happening. It can add to flakiness when you start to get up, you know, into those like hundreds and hundreds of steps. Um, but it's just really challenging. It's challenging for the customer when their step fails on step, you know, 217. Um, it's challenging for us on support when a customer comes in and asks for help and we realize like their test is eight minute long and um, you know, it's, it's step 300 that's failing. Um, so what I'm going to show you is how you can keep those actions uh, split out into separate tests and just tell Ghost Inspector to run one after another uh, and pass data between them. So in order to demonstrate this, I'm just going to, um, I'm going to go ahead and create a new test here. So we'll pop back into our demo website and we'll record a signup test. So uh, we'll start recording. This time we're going to click sign up. Uh, we're going to give this an email, give it a password, going to sign up. Uh, and of course, we're going to record uh, an assertion. So we'll make an assertion here, say thank you for signing up. Uh, and we'll go ahead and save this test. We'll call this sign up. Um, let's not do an initial test run of this one. We'll save it. So if I pop back over here, um, I've got uh, my sign up test, I've got add to cart, but again, these aren't really going to work in conjunction yet. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We'll come into the steps of the sign up test. This is what I just recorded here. Click on sign up, email, we're signing an email. Um, oftentimes what you need to do when you're creating a new account is that you need a new email address, right? Um, so maybe, maybe you're testing against an environment like purges the data out every time. Um, and you can always reuse the same address, but oftentimes you're going to need a new address each time. Otherwise, it's going to sign up with an email that that's already in use, right? Um, so what we're going to do is create a new uh, variable and, and put it into our email variable. Uh, so let's do new, and then I'm going to drop in this built-in timestamp variable. And what this does is it gets replaced at runtime with a, um, a timestamp that's down to the millisecond. So um, it's basically, for all intents and purposes, it's going to be unique every time. Um, so this is going to get created. It's going to get put in this uh, email variable. And then we're going to use that email variable to sign up. And the reason I'm putting this in a variable first, instead of just dropping this string down here, is so that I can pass this email variable onto the next test and it can be used. Um, so we'll go ahead and save this. Um, one other change I want to make, uh, since I'm going to run these tests in order, um, Ghost Inspector is going to run them in alphabetical order. So I'm going to use a numbering system that's going to help me designate um, the order of the test. So we'll just call this 001 sign up to make sure it comes first. We'll save the test. Um, and now we want our add item to car, uh, add item to cart test to run second. Uh, and we want it to use uh, that email. So in our step, we're actually, oh, excuse me, actually, let's pop back out here. Our, our logins are in the, the login test. We're actually in good shape here because it's already using um, the email address, the email variable. Um, the last thing I'm going to do is just give this test um, a 0, 0, 2 to make sure it's, it's very clear that it's the second test. So I've got my two tests. I'm going to sign up. Then I'm going to log in with that account and add an item to the cart. Um, now, the last thing I need to do is tell Ghost Inspector to run these tests um, sequentially. So I'm going to come into my suite settings here. I'm going to come down to concurrency. Uh, and I've got this option here to enable a concurrency limitation. Um, so what I actually get is a slider here. The, the reason this is a slider is this serves two different purposes. One is to be able to throttle your test runs. So instead of Ghost Inspector, say, running like 30 plus tests at a time, maybe you've got kind of an underpowered machine. Uh, in some cases, you know, we've had customers where they'll run their suite and it'll just like crush their staging server. Um, it's just too much traffic for it, for, you know, what's really kind of a test machine. Um, so you can actually throttle your test runs and tell Ghost Inspector to only run like five at a time. But if I bring this down to one, 
um, that's kind of a special value because if I'm running one test at a time, then that means I'm running sequentially. So I can do a few other neat things. Um, I can maintain variables. So in this case, I'm gonna pass that email variable from one test to the next. I can also abort on failure. So if any of my tests fail, I can just call off the suite and bail out. Um, but this is the option we want here to make sure that that email I'm generating gets passed to the next test. Uh, we'll save this and we'll go ahead and, and run the test. So you can see my signup test is running first here. This is not running yet. Um, so it's going to it's going to go through and sign up, creating that new email address that's going to be used with that timestamp in it. And then once this test finishes, it's going to take that email address that it created and it's going to pass it um, to the next test. So let's see here. We've got new with that timestamp string of numbers that was used. Now this is going to be passed along to my add item to cart test, uh, which is now running um, and using that email address. Uh, so this is a really nice option if you've got a situation where you want to run <clears throat> your tests one by one. Um, my advice would be to um, like only use this in situations where you have to. Like I said, if you've got a suite of 20 tests and they can all run in parallel, that's going to run way faster than running 20 tests one by one. So as much as possible, you should still try to design your tests in a way that they're com completely independent and can run one by one. But you're, you're bound to run into some situations occasionally where you've got a number of things that need to happen um, in order. And uh, this, this setting your concurrency down to one and passing variables between them um, is, a, is a really nice way to manage it while still keeping your tests nice and organized and segmented. We can see here where that email was passed in um, and, and we logged in with it here in our, in our second test. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is, is local tunneling. So we've got our demo site here. Um, and, you know, maybe this represents production. We've got a staging site and we've got like public URLs for those. Um, that's really easy for Ghost Inspector to get to, right? It's just a public URL. But I could be in a situation where I've got this website running locally on my machine and I want to test it. Um, so in this case, this, this demo website is actually, let me move this bar over here, is actually um, a, a repo that we have, right? So this is just a simple Next.js site. Um, and I can actually you know, start it up locally on my machine uh, and I can run it locally. So I come in here to localhost. Um, I've got the site, right? And this is, this is running on my machine and maybe I'm making changes and I wanna run the ghost inspector test to make sure everything still works. Um, so what I might think of doing is trying to take this URL and dropping this into ghost inspector, but this, this isn't gonna work. If I come in here and say, you know, run this suite and I drop in this localhost URL, this is not gonna work because localhost is really a, basically a reference to the machine's self. Um, so this is not going to get to my laptop, to my, to my instance of the website. Um, what I need to do is create a tunnel um, so that I can give Ghost Inspector an actual URL that it can access to get to this local copy of my website. Um, so there are a couple of different ways to do this. The, the one that we like and that we recommend is a tool um, called Ngrok. Um, this is a free tunneling tool. Um, it comes with a free plan, at least, that you can tinker with. They have paid plans, um, you know, if you're using lots of capacity. And what it does is it, it creates a URL and it's going to assign it um, to, my, to my local uh, instance here. So um, let's come over uh, to this tab and I've got ngrok here. So what I can do is say, I want to create an HTTP tunnel and then I give it the port number. So in this case, I'm running on local port uh, 3000 here, it corresponds here. Um, so that's what I'm going to drop in. And when I, when I launch this, what it's going to do is create these URLs that are going to forward to uh, my copy, my local copy. And actually, if I take these and drop one, um, in my browser, I can actually get to my site essentially through the tunnel. Um, so a little bit roundabout, but you can see here, um, the HTTP requests that are coming here are coming through my browser that are going through NGROC and making it to my site. Um, now this URL, I can come in here and run this 
um, oh, whoops. I can come in here and run this using this URL here. Um, so that will work. Let's just, we'll go ahead and run the sign up test like that just to show you. Um, that is going to work, and Ghost Inspector will be able to come through and use this same tunnel. Um, you can see here making requests. Um, and again, this is this is testing my local copy of the site um, and using a tunnel to do it. Um, so this is a really handy way, especially if you're kind of working manually, you're working on your site, or you're pulling down maybe a branch that somebody has built and you spin it up locally. Um, you can go ahead and, uh, and and have Ghost Inspector run tests against it pretty easily by, by spinning up these URLs uh, and, and launching. So we can see the ngrok URL was used here. Um, so that's a really feature for a really useful feature for, for testing local websites. Uh, and I'll touch on this again, but this also works if you're doing like continuous integration and a, and a system uh, like Circle CI or Layer CI that launches your app. Uh, inside a container, you'll need to tunnel into that with some kind of URL that Ghost Inspector can get to. So it's useful in that situation as well. Um, I guess two, two quick caveats I should throw out there. One is that um, for the most part, this generally works, assuming your site is straightforward and is just working through a single port. Um, if you've got a site that's doing kind of complex things with different ports, like you might run into a little bit of a challenge um, with traffic accidentally going outside of the tunnel. Um, or if your website isn't really uh, cool with having a, a random domain assigned to it, that may be a hiccup also. Um, and secondly, um, if you're working in kind of a corporate environment inside of a VPN, there, there are ways to support that as well, but it's definitely something worth talking to your team and your system administrator about to make sure that they're comfortable with you using a tool like NGROC. Um, so two quick notes on that. The last thing we're gonna touch on is our CLI command command line tool. Um, so we've been working with Ghost Inspector here, you know, primarily through the app, but of course we have an API that lets you trigger things as well. Um, and what we built recently is um, a CLI tool that makes it really easy to trigger things through my command line. Um, we can install it really easily. So I'm gonna use NPM to install it. NPM is Node Package Manager. So if you've got Node.js installed, um, this will be available to you. I'm gonna do npm install. I'm gonna do a dash G to make it a global. And I'm just gonna hit Ghost Inspector. So this is gonna install our um, Ghost Inspector NPM package. And now once this is installed, I actually get this Ghost Inspector command right uh, in, in my command line that I can use. Um, and I can do a whole bunch of things through here. I can interact with folders, my organization, results, suites, tests. Um, and I can use it to do just about anything I can do uh, through the API. So triggering tests, triggering switch, fetching results, so on and so forth. Um, as I start to drill into these, um, I can even get more, um, more help. So I can see all the commands that are available to me, um, even for saying like executing a test. Um, I can see that all these different options are available to me, um, specifying lists of browsers or screen sizes, you know, NGROC tunneling, which we'll do in a second. I can turn screenshot comparison on and off. I could pass in custom variables. Um, a huge amount of, of power is available to you um, in these commands. So just to show you an example here, let's say I want to execute, um, we'll do our signup test. All I need to do is copy paste this, this ID here in my URL. I'll drop it in um, and Ghost Inspector is going to go ahead and trigger uh, this test from my command line. Um, so this makes it really nice if you want to set up like cron jobs locally or just uh, launch things locally or again inside of uh, continuous integration systems, um, I, can, I can use these commands. Um, I can also do the same type of thing I did with NGROC tunnels. I can even um, launch an NGROC tunnel right uh, like like we did manually right inside with this command. So let's see, I'm gonna do post 3000, then I'm gonna do ngrok um, URL variable. So I'm gonna take that ngrok URL and I'm gonna put it in my, let's make this a little bigger. Let's put it in my website URL variable that, that we're using. Um, and Ghost Inspector is going to go ahead and create that NGROC tunnel for me. 
uh, it's going to pass it into my URL and it's going to run the test uh, with that. Uh, so really handy tool that especially ties into like that local that local use case for you. Um, that's about time for me. So I'm going to wind it down. Um, like I said, this video is going to be online. Um, so uh, you can always come back and reference the thing I've touched on. We're going to leave a little bit of time at the end of the call where I'll try to answer any questions um, you have about these topics that I covered. Um, as always, um, you know, feel free to reach out to us online, support anytime. We're happy to chat through these concepts or give you recommendations that might help you um, as you're using Ghost Inspector to test your application. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass it back to Renata. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you, Justin. I hope everyone enjoyed that portion. Um, so uh, happy to see everyone. Um, I've seen some familiar faces here today. Jennifer Schaefer, Team Snap is in the house. I see Seth Pierce. I think I saw Vladimir Zanin from the Zenny team. It's so great to see a lot of our longtime customers with us today. Um, so thank you again for joining us. As Justin said, this is being recorded. Um, I have seen some questions come in, some that I haven't been able to answer. I'll let Justin, uh, while Autumn's presenting next, uh, take a look at those so he can answer and address a few of those during the Q&A portion. So with that being said, um, I'd love to present uh, Autumn Bruno. She is the Chief Operating Officer at JDA QA. As I mentioned, they are a preferred partner of ours. She has almost a decade of QA experience, much of it in leading roles. She excels in putting new processes in place and spotting opportunities to improve on existing ones. So please welcome Autumn Bruno. Hey, everyone. Um, so JDA QA is a team of QA professionals who help implement and maintain QA for a wide variety of companies in all different sectors. We come into a project and implement and improve processes while suggesting best practices, including not over testing. We want to test the right things in the best way, so we're not wasting time running through meaningless tests. We use Ghost Inspector regularly to build out automation in addition to building and maintaining manual test suites. We found solutions like Selenium are really not best suited for automation anymore with tools like Ghost Inspector around. There are edge cases out there where we have to use it, but it's hard to organize and maintain a test suite, hard to understand without development skills, and time intensive to build. Ghost Inspector is our go-to automation tool to build cases out due to the ease of automation, great organization of test cases, excellent support, and the versatility we've all just seen. We use Ghost Inspector paired with manual test cases to build a full test case suite out. We integrate quickly with your team to determine the highest priority and best approach. Our first targets for automation are always simple, high value cases. Not everything needs to be automated, but the simple repetitive things should be. Using this mixed approach of manual and automation frees up QA resources to really dig into the app's more complex features and user flow, rather than wasting valuable time on cases that can easily be automated. So I've talked in the abstract. Here's an actual example of how we've used Ghost Inspector for a client along with our whole QA process. Um, this application specifically was for presenting. Uh, we met quickly with the team and discussed the processes, document documentation, and general state of QA. Initially, we started with creating separate spaces within their workflow for QA to accept or reject tickets, created an organized manual test suite within a tool rather than Excel, and we started identifying and prioritizing automated test cases by looking for simple to automate test cases and taking into account dev and PM assessment of priority and problem areas. We went on to put really solid processes in place. We refined and made sure that the workflow made sense and fit in with the company's current practices. We put automated runs into the release pipeline. We made sure that sufficient documentation was present and up to date so that anyone could go in and understand the processes that we used. We made sure that the right information was getting into tickets. To dig further into these processes and how they work on the daily, I wanted to run through what our QA workflow really looks like. We're involved from the beginning. Participating in reviewing requirements is the first place to catch bugs before they're even being coded. Next, we integrated with the Ghost Inspector test runs into the pipeline. This is another area where we can catch bugs before they even get to the QA space. Um, and in this space, 
where the requirement is being written and code is being developed, we really start to assess whether or not this would be a good candidate for automation by taking user experience, priority, and ease of automation into account. We get the ticket for testing and we test manually to understand the workflow and look at it from a user perspective. But at the same time, we either automate the ticket or record a manual test case. We've hit the regression test cases through Ghost Inspector. So this frees up the time to dig into the functionality of the ticket and create test cases while still having a good turnaround time. So we're not over testing here. We make sure that we're focusing on the most important things and regression has already been covered with Ghost Inspector. After that, we accept or reject the ticket. Um, and these are some specific examples uh, that we've used Ghost Inspector to automate and kind of how we've used Ghost Inspector. The first one is log in, log out, much like Justin's example. Um, it's really good to use variables here, uh, especially when you have applications where you have to change your password every 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, then you don't have to go in and manually update all those test cases. You can just change it at a variable level. Um, text chat is another one. And we use sequential testing here to really simulate the order that a chat would happen and validate the users can both send and receive messages correctly. The next one is polling. Uh, we use a lot of sequen sequential testing here too uh, to create a poll having participants vote on it and showing the results of that poll. So, and then we also rely on data-driven testing here so we can run different polls with, um, with different options in them. Um, another one is profile settings. This one's just very easy to automate, uh, checking field validation and changes are saved. Uh, and then the last one is presenting a slideshow. Um, where we uploaded an outside file and we really utilize the screenshot feature here to make sure that the correct uh, presentation was getting uploaded and um, the screenshot comparison was great uh, at making sure that that functionality was working correctly. Um, and then we saved kind of like the high value test cases that would be hard to automate as manual. Um, so we've got camera functionality and speaker functionality. Those are just not easy to automate. And manually, you can really gather a lot more uh, about the quality and user experience if you're going in there and actually testing versus automating those tests. Um, so you can see how the versatility and ease of use of Ghost Inspector has made it really easy for us to integrate it into our QA process. And I'll hand it back to Renata. Thank you for that, Autumn, so great. Um, JDA QA is one of our first uh, preferred partners. We do get a lot of customers coming in asking for those additional additional professional services. And you know, Ghost Inspector, we're a small but mighty team. But at this point, we um, you know can't offer those kinds of professional services just yet. Um, but we're more than happy to partner with with JDA QA and um, offer those referrals over. So if anyone's interested, um, their information is up on the slide and we'll offer it in um, the email and blog post. Um, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions on, on what they can offer you. Um, we um, definitely enjoy working with them. So um, this is definitely the time for questions. Justin, if you had a chance to look at the chat and if you have anything, and if there's any questions for Autumn, feel free to raise your hand, but um, I think we can kick it off because I know there's a few questions in chat, Justin, so. Yeah, yeah, so I'll <clears throat> just try to run through some of these that um, I've seen. Uh, Pavel asked about, I think the making multiple selections with browsers and screen size and geolocations, will it still do the screenshot comparison of the video? And, and yes, it will. So it will capture a video for each one. It will do a screenshot comparison for each one. And what's cool is the system is smart enough to know that it's going to compare the you know iPhone 5 size view to the last iPhone 5 size view. So you're not going to run into an issue where it's like comparing screenshots of the wrong size. Um, the way the baseline works is uh, the way the baseline works is that it maintains um, itself based on screen size, geolocation, and browser. So those three parameters, every combination is going to have its own baseline, and Ghost Inspector is going to know how that how that screenshot should look. Um, a couple I'll just touch on um, that I answered in the QA, but um, a question was asked about uh, customizing HTTP authentication um, settings. 
Uh, so you can use variables in, in those settings. Um, and so you could customize those at runtime the same way we did, uh, like when, when we're using the email variable or the, the start your variable. Um, and I think we also have the intention to add those in the, in the modal um, run box as well to give you a little bit quicker access to that. Um, uh, Alessandro asked a, a, like a really good question. If, if you're uploading a big set of data, um, you know, if you've got a test, let's say on your, on your sign up form, and you want to test with a bunch of data and some of that data is going to work properly and some of it's going to fail, right? Because maybe the email is invalid. Um, how do you kind of know, like, is the test expected to pass or fail? That's a really good question. So a couple of different approaches, like you could use conditionals um, to kind of handle like what's going to happen or what should be uh, you know, skipped. There's a step action in there that sometimes doesn't get a lot of attention, but there's actually a step action called um, exit test and you can exit your test early with a passing or a failing status. And that kind of pairs up nice with conditionals to exit like with a passing status before something fails or vice versa. Uh, but the recommendation that I made, which I think maybe makes it a little bit simpler is to have two copies of the test. And one is one that's going to run, run through the sign up and expect a success message. And one is going to run through the sign up and expect a failure message. Um, and then you have two different data sources. So you have your data source of data that should pass and your data source of data that should fail. Uh, and that might be a, just a cleaner way to do it so that you're not getting too complex with your test logic. Um, I kind of thought of that on the fly. So maybe there's better ways to do it, but that's the one that came to mind for me. Um, Oscar asked if it's possible to integrate Ghost Inspector with Browser Stack or a tool like Sauce Labs or any of the external um, kind of browser running platforms. We don't have any direct integrations at the moment. One thing we do have that um, I wanted to squeeze into this webinar, but we didn't have time. We do have a number of export options. One of them is the newer Selenium IDE format, which is basically a JSON format. And I believe that Selenium IDE tool comes with some command line tools to run your tests. So you basically just like give it the files and it runs it. And I believe those do integrate, like you can tell it to run your tests on browser stack or sauce labs or Lambda test or what have you. Um, so not, not like a super like clean one touch kind of integration, but you can export your tests out of there. Um, and run them on a, on a different type of platform if you'd like. And you can obviously use Selenium ID to run them um, locally as well. Um, let's see, those were the questions I was able to um, spot so far. Um, well, one question was how do we send a variable um, with the API method? So in the CLI tool that I used, you just do a dash dash and the name of your variable. So you could do dash dash website URL it basically, it, it acts like a parameter, but as long as it's not one of our reserved words, the API is just gonna assume it's a variable and it's gonna pass it into your tests um, and, and make it available. Um, let's see. Notification uh, received on any website. Um, maybe, I, I'm not sure if I'm reading this question correctly. How can we test success or failure notification received on any website? Um, I, that may go back to, my case where I'm recommending two tests where like you have a scenario that's expected to pass and is looking for that outcome. And it, the other one is expecting the operation not to work and is looking for that outcome. So both tests would be passing, but one is looking for the success outcome and one's looking for the failure outcome. Um, I hope, you know, that that's maybe like hits on your question a little bit. Um, how do we bypass Google sign in through GI? Uh, you don't really, um, you know, for a, for a, a third party like that, that's really designed to not be accessed in an automated way, um, you know, like Facebook and Google, um, you're just, you're not gonna beat their system. They've really designed it not to let bots in. So our recommendation is always to use your own authentication, um, you know, library or set up a specific use case for your test. That's an issue you're gonna run into, not really just with Ghost Inspector, but any kind of automation because um, those systems are designed specifically to exclude automation. Um, oh, it looks like we're not run out of beat me to that one. So I'm just recapping. Um, <laughs> okay, I think, I think you have room for one more and then we have to wrap it up. Let's see. Um, 
uh, here's a here's a good one from um, from John Pollard. If you're setting a variable at suite level, but then overriding it in a script, does this interfere with the passing of that variable between scripts? That's a great question. Um, so it doesn't interfere, but it does override it. So if you remember with our setup, we had an email variable set at the suite level, right? So that's kind of where the variable starts. But if any of my tests assign a value to that variable, we treat it like it's being reassigned. So I had like test at test.com. Uh, if my my first sign up test creates a new email and assigns it to that email variable, it's going to overwrite that value, and that's the one that will be passed on um, to the test following. Okay. Uh, there's a whole bunch of questions here, and I I knew there would be. Um, so I think what we can do maybe is make a point on our blog post to try to um, filter some of these down and touch on a few of them. And in the link that will follow up with the webinar, could be a couple of days, but um, we'll try to get some of these answered for you. Yeah. And feel free, we do have um, help at ghostinspector.com as well. If any of our customers are here, we have our intercom widget on the bottom right hand corner of any of our um, application, web, our, our web app pages. Um, so feel free to send us any questions. Again, uh, we'll send out the recording uh, once it's ready in a day or two. And um, we will be hosting another webinar uh, in July. Uh, you're hearing it here first. It will be with uh, Layer CI. Uh, there's CEO and our CEO, Battle of the CEOs. Uh, no, it will be in collaboration. Um, our using our tools together. Um, we're very excited. We have recently released uh, that integration uh, last month, Justin, is that correct? So we'll be uh, demonstrating how to use that. Um, so please let us know uh, any feedback you have. And again, these are, are new for us. And if you have any subjects you'd like to see, someone mentioned new users. Um, so if you, you'd like to see some uh, maybe not advanced ghost inspector things, maybe some more specific new user stuff, please let us know. Please be specific. Um, we're here definitely to help you. And obviously, it seems like our customers are enjoying this. So we, we want to make sure we're tailoring it to exactly your needs. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Autumn, thank you again for joining us as well. And we really appreciate everyone's time. Bye, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Autumn. Thanks, everyone, for joining.